I just think that more than a mom stands out to me because it is being a mother is not just this one set of activities that I do with my son. Being a mother is 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 part of how I move through the world. Mm -hmm. it, it just has been like focus. No, it's, there's, there's now an actual like a, a little human who's the focus of it. <laughs> but that energy and that way that I move through the world has been maternal for a long time. Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Heather Shea. Today, in honor of the upcoming holiday, we are sharing perspectives of several mothers who work in or adjacent to the field of student affairs in higher education. We will be discussing the many challenges facing women as caregivers during a pandemic, as well as the various joys of being an SA mom or SAM. Before I introduce my guest today, I need to share a little bit more about our podcast and today's sponsors. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by Simplicity. A true partner, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. This episode is also sponsored by Vector Solutions, formerly EverFi, the trusted partner for 2,000 plus colleges and universities. Vector Solutions is a standard of care for student safety, well-being, and inclusion. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about each sponsor. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting from the campus of Michigan State University. Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. So excited for the four of you to join me today. Thank you so much. Um, I thought maybe we'd start with just brief introductions. Tell us a little bit about you, what your um, name, pronouns, ro role model, role, excuse me, on your institutional campuses and all of that would be great. Um, so Kathy, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Kathy Adams Reister. I am the Associate Vice Provost of Student Affairs and Executive Associate Dean of Students at Indiana University in Bloomington. And I use she, her, and her pronouns. Thanks for being here, Kathy. Thank you. Um, Meg. My name is Meg Moore. I am the Director of Graduate Student Life and Wellness here at Michigan State. That's an office that works with the graduate and professional students, um, providing them with wellness, well-being, and leadership programs. And I use she, her pronouns. Happy to be here. Great. Kim, welcome. Welcome back, Thank I should you. say. Actually, all three of you, I think, have been on podcast episodes yeah. before. Okay. So welcome back. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Hi everyone, and my name is Kim Steve Page. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the director of the Student Parent Resource Center at Michigan State University. So I have the privilege of working with student parents, families, kids, and student caregivers. Great, thank you so much. And Alexandria, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Alexandria White. I am the current Senior Vice President for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion for a women-owned, women-led um, consulting company called Reboot Excel. And when I'm not doing that, I am adjunct faculty at the University of Mississippi, and I use the pre pronouns she, her, and hers. And I have the privilege of being the founder and creator of Student Affairs Moms. Yes. In fact, that is the impetus for today's episode. Um, Part of what I was thinking about and I actually came up to you after the um, stage uh, show. So at ACPA this year, there was a panel on the main stage about student affairs moms um, and, and the Facebook group broadly. But um, I'm really curious about the backstory. So could Alexandra, could you tell us a little bit about how the group came to be and, and what it has become? Um, it has become the, one of the reasons I keep my Facebook account. Um, because <laughs> it joy. Um, that is the one thing about social media, but it just came from um, a need of mine. I was the only mom, woman of color in my department, and I worked in housing. 
And I just remember being so frustrated, um, scared, um, being on duty. And if you work in residence life and housing, you know that being on duty is 24 hours. And I had a little kid who's going to watch her while I'm on duty, taking care of a overflow, overflown, to, overflown, uh, overflow to, toilet. I think I said that right. Or a, um, a party that I have to break down and, um, or break up. And so I'm like, uh, you know, I work in student affairs. There's got to be a group for moms. You know, does ACPA have one? Does NASPA have one or NACA or COOI? And <laughs> there was nothing. And I said, well, who can help me unpack living on campus, being a woman of color, being a mom? And so I sat at home and I'm thinking, student affairs moms. We love acronyms in higher education. Okay. <laughs> and um, that's how it came about is I just needed someone to talk to and understand my plight of living where I work, being a mom, having to find a babysitter when I'm on duty, having to find a babysitter when I'm in RA training or grad training um, during the summer months. Um, and just all of those things. And next thing you know, it's 2022 and it's almost 8,000 moms in this um, Facebook group. And I am so humbled. I, I, I still can't believe it. Um, it just came from a need of mine and wanting to find my people. Well, it's, it's clear that it has become a source of much support and an incredible resource um, as well, right? So we always think about like, how can Facebook give us something back? And I think that this is a space that really gives, um, gives us all something back. So thank you for the dedication and for the constant presence. Um, I'd love to hear the rest of you all um, tell us a little bit about your mom's story. Any, any specific uh, experiences that bring you to this conversation um, today? And if you would be willing to share us a, a little bit of information about your families and or children, that would be great. And uh, Kim, we'll start with you. Yes, I, people are probably tired of hearing about my kids because I love to talk about my kids because they energize me and keep me also very humble. <laughs> Anytime I start feeling I'm a little too good about myself, I have, I have an eight-year-old and a 17-year-old, um, both boys. And so a nine-year age difference. And one is a senior in high school, my baby, and dealing with some emotions around that this entire school year, and an eight-year-old who's in third grade. So for me, um, I think one of my biggest challenges is uh, it has been kind of navigating um, the age difference in terms of um, thinking about their needs, you know, how to have conversations. You know, we were also the last two years, there have been quite a bit of unfortunate things, um, you know, in the media, in the world, um, and having to manage those conversations and keep them um, supported and really, you know, check on their mental health. And the Sam's uh, page was amazing for resources around, uh, even though I work you know, in the field, I, I have found so many resources and shared so many resources with my student families from um, the Sam's um, comments and, and just a great opportunity to get new information and also to find support and to, uh, it helped me to not feel like I was the only one you know, kind of going through these things, you know, of course, you know, you're not the only one, but in general, it can feel very isolating. I think that was the biggest thing. And also um, the Facebook page for me took away that element of um, shame and, you know, that feeling of I shouldn't be feeling this way, or I shouldn't, I shouldn't not know these, <laughs> these things. Um, so I think, you know, coming to this conversation, it was, you know, just a, a great reminder of how much we need each other, you know, and how much we need to um, lean on each other for that support. Um, and even mentoring, especially for newer professionals or newer to student affairs, um, new moms even, so just, you know, so much opportunity. And moms are amazing anyway, so talented in so many areas. So it's always a great day to be a mom. 
Thanks, Kim. That was a good segue to our newest mom of the group. Um, Meg, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background and, <laughs> and your and your newest addition to the family. Yeah. So um, I, uh, my wife and I have a son, Kieran. He's going to be seven months old um, in three days. Um, and time, it's one of those funny things about time where it's like, I can't remember a time before Kieran was part of our family. And it, it also just feels like it's going by very quickly. And you know, everyone, everyone, literally everyone that we've talked about, hey, we have a child. It's like, just, you know, drink in every minute, like, to, you just go so fast. And, mm -hmm. and I feel like we're so present and so, so aware of that, that it almost itself becomes a barrier because you're just, you know, especially we both work full time. My wife also works at Michigan State as an assistant professor. Um, and, you know, it's, that puts some pressure on the feeling that like, when you're at home, like, you have to just be so fully present. And, um, and it feels bad to be away, you know, at the office and working. And so, and of course, you know, I think that's a, just a, a constant struggle of being a working mom. Uh, and um, yeah, he's, he's, so I'm also older, so I'm 47 and, um, and most of my friends have kids that are graduating from high school and just in a totally different stage of life. Um, and, uh, and that's what my wife carried, um, and, and actually did the having of the baby. I was, you know, I was, I was there, uh, I helped, but she, she did all the heavy lifting was, uh, was on, was her end. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's also just been an interesting thing coming, becoming a mom at, at the stage of life where I am and the age that I am and the career development where I am. And so that's, um, there've been a lot, so many things I've reflected on. So I have a lot, <laughs> a lot of things that I've thought about. Um, but more than anything, it's just been like hard, the people, it's, it's the hardest thing it's just in some ways to raise a child. And of course, during a pandemic, it's really scary to have a newborn who's so vulnerable. Um, that's been a huge, um, you know, part of the last two years, even making sure that she, Ashley didn't get sick so that she could become pregnant when, you know, the time that we wanted to. Um, so there've been a lot of things, uh, going on there but that's just so that's just kind of a, a, a broad overview of uh of what our life looks like and um we're real excited it's the last week of school so Ashley's going to be home for most of the summer she is so <laughs> excited that the semester is almost <laughs> over so we're we're been in survival mode uh for the last couple months so yeah we're all just waiting until that last moment. I love it. And, and to Kathy, beyond my own mom, shout out to Susan, who's probably listening. Beyond my, mama, my own mom, Kathy is probably the person who I have learned the most about being a mom from because I have known you for forever, it feels like. Um, so Kathy, tell us a little bit about your, your two kids and being a mom. Sure. So I have two sons. I have a son who is um, 21, who is a junior in college, and a son who is 17, who's a junior in high school. So they're four years apart. Um, and I think, um, as Heather mentioned, when I first started, when I had my first child, um, I met Heather when he was about a year old, but I feel like for me, it's always been important to find community, especially with other working moms, because no one else really understands what you're going through unless you have that community. And I think just having that support from other moms is so important um, with that. So it was great when um, Heather and I have two sons that are about six months apart. Um, so I was pregnant with my second child and she was pregnant with her first child. So we also got kind of that pregnancy mom bonding, which also was super special. Um, so I, I've always appreciated that. And I just think the community um, that is built between having those, you know, the support system of other moms is so important, especially when you're trying to navigate the work that we do in student affairs, which doesn't often have normal hours, it has different schedules and trying to figure out how you navigate everything is, is super challenging. So I think things like student affairs moms is such a blessing because that conversation isn't really happening otherwhere. You really have to individually seek it out with other people who you find out have children um, to be able to find that support as a mom. So I'm super excited and excited to be part of this, this group. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for all of you being here. Um, just, I am also entering this conversation as a mom, as Kathy said, I have a 17 year old and I also have a 14 year old. Um, and I'm a single parent, uh, have gone through a divorce. And so like to add to the element of what it means to work in student affairs, I think that's part of the story may or may not come up today. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about 
a little bit more about uh, the Facebook page. And Alexandria, I think one of the things that I've really appreciated um, as I was reviewing is the crowdsourcing of support and the anonymous posts or the asking for a friend kind of posts. Um, what, if you had to kind of summarize, what are the most uh, prevalent or pressing issues facing SAMs on the page? I think right now, if you go to the anonymous posts, so um, Facebook does give um, admins the um, ability to look at analytics on the back end. So I'm aware of um, keywords, when does Sam's post, um, what city and state has the most Sam's. So I'm a nerd in that aspect and I love to look at those numbers. But a lot of my anonymous posts are right now is, do I stay in student affairs? Mm. Heather, we talked about that. Um, Heather okay. and, and Kathy, we talked about that at um, ACPA. And I think it's a time for leadership to have that conversation. You see opt-ins from the Chronicle. You see um, think, think pieces about retention and attrition in student affairs. And the anonymous posts are, and um, when I was prepared for this, I went through where the different touch points where I get the anonymous post, which is the website and um, they can message me. And it's, I'm overworked. I'm underpaid. Um, it seems there is a lack of empathetic leadership from um, college um, administrators. And do I stay in student affairs? Because I love this profession. Um, it's so many things that people are unpacking. And um, of course, um, mental and physical well being. Those are the that I am seeing. And I can't answer them all. And um, if someone messages me, I, I try to, you know, yes, I can post this, but I, how are you doing? Um, mm. How can I help them back in? But those are the two, mental and physical well-being. And do I stay in this profession mm. that just seems to continue to take at this time and not give back? Mm. Yeah, that is... Um... I think that's that was my takeaway from the, the from the panel at ACPA as well. And so adding in those needed supports, I think, is really critical. Um, I'm actually going to skip us down a little bit to talking about parenting in the pandemic, because I think that um, really pulls nicely from what you just talked about, Alexandria. Um, I know flexible and remote work have become kind of essential and vital, right, in student affairs. Um, and Kathy is our senior level administrator on the group. Um, maybe, Kath, can you talk a little bit about how moms can advocate for flexibility and, and then how you can, you know, hear that and support and what are the supports that you're able to provide? So I would say, first, it's important to figure out where your institution is on this issue. Um, are they supporting flexible work? Are they supporting um, hybrid schedules or remote, you know, days per week remote schedule? And find out what your policies are for your institution, because I think really, honestly, they're all over the place across the country right now. I think institutions are realizing they probably need to figure out how um, to address this. Um, but I think everyone's in a different place on what that looks like right this second. Um, so I think figuring that out and then um, figuring out what's realistic um, for your situation is important. So for in my, my institution, um, we aren't really offering a lot of fully remote work unless you're in a really not a front facing position which most of our student affairs positions are, are pretty front facing. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in work schedules and things like that. But some of the things you have to do is you have to have stable internet. Um, and, you know, there's some things that you have to have um, because also, especially at public institutions, there are also OSHA law, you know, laws and, and things like that that are federal laws that come into place with the workplace setting and those kinds of things. So I, I don't know that higher education is quite as flexible as the private industry around things like that. So I think figuring that out and then figuring out what you really need and what's realistic and having that conversation with your supervisor. I, and I think things are also in flux. Um, so being able to know that things might be one way right now and then the flexibility may be increasing as we kind of move into this next year and, and employers are really evaluating that. Um, so for me, one of the ways that, that we support it, because we're not at a, you know, fully, 
working remote options. Um, and we're a little bit of hybrid, um, but really what we're offering the best is flexibility um, mm. for our staff. So I think the flexibility is, you know, I, I think about several of my staff members who have young children that are in the, the daycare age and how often this spring, even with Omicron and the other variants that daycare was closed because all it takes is one kid in the class to be sick and a whole classroom will close. So offering as much flexibility as I can to staff to um, be creative with their work schedules to help manage and balance daycare when the daycare is closed, um, you know, is one of the things that, that we can do. And so I think part of it is, you know, we've really worked individually with different staff members um, to help support them. Um, and part of it too also is that you can't say things like, oh, well, I'm working from home. I'm not going to be answering my phone. I mean, you really have to be able to do your job from your home. So figuring out what that balance is about how you're helping to support, um, you know, your child and their needs at home, but also the balance of being able to do the work that you need to do. So I think it's kind of a meeting in the middle. Um, you know, I would, that's what I would kind of recommend. I think when you think about how you want to talk about this with your supervisor to kind of engage engage in that and, and what you will have set up to ensure that you're really getting um, your things done. And things need to be kind of done during the workday a lot of times. I mean, sometimes there's flexibility on project at night, but you know your presence at meetings that are happening during regular schedule hours and things like that are also important. So having that kind of idea of you know what, what you can support is also helpful. Thanks, Hath. Um, I want to pop back to one of the questions that I had earlier, um, which is about uh, kind of hashtags on the thread. Um, and as I was reviewing the Sam's Facebook group, I liked how different topics and conversations were available by searching, right? So um, I thought it might be kind of interesting to hear if you all have a story that kind of resonates with a specific hashtag um, about being a mom in student affairs and that you wouldn't mind sharing. Um, with our listeners. So Kim, what's your hashtag? What's your story and what's your hashtag? <laughs> you know, um, I'm gonna go with that hashtag that you mentioned, I mom so hard. <laughs> it's probably it. connected to hashtag mom guilt. So my story <laughs> is, um, it has a good ending, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Thanks my, for the good warning. <laughs> my, husband, my husband is a professional musician and Things have started to come back, thankfully, mm -hmm. because he was about almost two years with no work, um, which is a whole separate episode. But <laughs> he had a meeting. Um, he was going to work in some schools. And I also, I had a 7.30 meeting. So um, we are fortunate enough to have before and after care um, in our school. So I said, no problem. I will drop um, the eight-year-olds off at aftercare um, right at seven and then take the high schooler onto school. So dropped off the um, eight-year-old at before care, like we typically do, went on to um, drop off my high schooler. And as I was parking, because um, I work within about a one mile radius of the schools, uh, as I was parking, I see my phone ringing and, and it's actually my son's um, teacher. And so I picked up, the, uh, answered the phone and she said, you know, um, <laughs> Bryson's here in the vestibule. Um, I just happen to hear we don't. There's no before care um, today. I'm not sure if you <laughs> received the email from before care that um, they were short staffed because this. What it happened is that Michigan State delayed the re return back to um, face to face instruction at the beginning of January. So the before care who was run primarily by college students was <laughs> was suspended. I missed that email completely. And uh, so my eight year old was there at school and nobody else was there yet, but the, the vestibule part was open. And so his teacher said, well, you know, it's no problem if you want, you know, if he doesn't mind just coming into the classroom with me, he can, you know, help me do some work. And so uh, I hear him on, on the, in the background say, can I talk to my mom? And then he said, mom, this is just like that movie that I watched about home alone. It was so alone. <laughs> and I felt so terrible because he says, I was all by myself, but, <laughs> and I, but I'm okay. You know, my teacher, I'm going to go to my teacher into my teacher's classroom. So it worked out fine, but I felt so guilty about um, missing the email, dropping him off. You know, he was left all alone. Uh, it just, it, 
all of the chaos that has um, been created. I'm normally a pretty organized when it comes to the kids stuff and I'm the keeper of the schedules and everything. So um, that was, you know, so I just had to say, you know, hashtag mom guilt and hashtag I'm mom so hard. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, I love it. The phone, the kids getting onto the phone too. It's just like, oh, oh. Meg, what about you? What story would you share? Well, uh, when I read through the list of hashtags, I was like, more than a mom stood out to me um, because I think there it's such a layered experience because being a mom and especially being like, like entering in, um, you know, and being fresh in this, it's like, I'm still getting used to this idea that I'm a, I'm a mom, you know, like I still have to say it when I look at him, I'm like, that's my son. I'm his mom. Like I have to keep like doing this. Um, and so I think the idea of like, I, and the layers of like, but I, and I'm also this, this professional that has been working that has, you know, my background is in mental health. I was a therapist and I still do, um, uh, I have a small private practice on the side. And so I have that in addition to my, you know, my full-time job. Um, and so, but, but being a therapist informs everything that I do. And so being a therapist, the child and I developmental psychology is also one of my favorite areas. So being like way overly aware of attachment issues and like stages of cognitive and development and how do you develop empathy and how do you develop the skills at this really early age so that and especially for like little boys, you know, like when one and all the different messages they get about feelings and all these things. And so, uh, so that's, it, there's not necessarily a particular story that goes along with that, but that was the hashtag that stood out to me because I am so looking for evidence of like, he seems to have positive attachment. Well, I will, okay, I'll start the one, one, the story, one story that came to mind was, um, there was a loud noise in the kitchen. Ashley was like using the blender or something. And so like, you know, I knew it was coming and Kieran's sitting on my lap and I just got done feeding him and he heard, he hears the noise and it startles him and he turns and he whips his head around and he looks and he looks right at me. And it was this like moment, this like beautiful moment of like, you see his little lip quivering, like he was scared. He didn't know what to do. And he looked at me and I was very conscious in that moment of being like, I want to affirm his feelings. Like, yeah, buddy, that was scary. And, and also like, Reflect, reflect back to him that he was okay. And it happened very quickly and kind of instinctively, you know, as I just am making my face do these things to this little baby on my lap. And I saw the recognition. I saw him go from scared to feeling okay. And it was like, like such a simple moment, but I'm like, that's, that's it. And I, and I think that's also like this connecting like to, to what I do and the work that I do either as a therapist or in my role um, at Michigan State is like is providing those spaces where we're, whatever the student is coming to us with, that we're containing it for them. We're, we're, we're you know, acknowledging that what they're feeling is valid and like trying to also move them to a place where they feel okay about whatever's going on. Um, and so it's just, this is kind of all the meta, the meta layers of being a mom, having a maternal energy. Um, I think student affairs, there's a lot of maternal work that I do mm -hmm. um, with students, with um, colleagues even. And so, um, yeah, so I, I just think that more than a mom stands out to me because it is being a mother is not just this one set of activities that I do with my son. Being a mother is, is, is part of how I move through the world. Mm -hmm. it, it just has been like, focus no, it's, there's, there's now an actual like a, a, a little human who's the focus of it <laughs> but that energy and that way that I move through the world has been maternal for a long time and so that's um yeah that's what I was thinking about I love that that's a great story I love the applicability and calling upon that knowledge that you have in that moment um instinctually that's great um Alexandria what what hashtag would you um like to adopt and then share a story around um hashtag mom win I um, have a 17 year old and I was thinking of how many years she's lived on a college campus and she has lived on a, man, she's lived on a college campus uh, about 10 years of her life and, or college town. And she really is a student affairs um, kid. Um, but I travel a lot now doing diversity work um, when I'm not um, working at the university. And I mom wins are those little things where she says, mom, um, you forgot to send me money for groceries. 
And I, uh, oh, mom failed, but let me cash up you some money for groceries. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, just leaving her sometime. Um, uh, my mom does come in and, and check on her. Uh, my mom lives really close, but the mom win is that she is uh, very independent. And uh, my friend took her to get groceries. And she said it was so funny seeing Emery coming out of the store like a little, you know, a little grown up with her own. <laughs> and so that was my mom win. And um, it took a little bit of guilt away, actually, saying that I've raised this um, independent uh, person that's going to go off in the world, um, even when I'm not there. And it's okay that I'm not there. She's got it. So that was my mom. That is great. What a great story. Um, Kathy, what's your hashtag story? So I'm going to also say hashtag mom win. Um, so I, through most of my career, I have had some amount of involvement with student conduct um, and those kinds of things. So I've always been big in talking with my sons about consent. Um, even from the time they were little, um, I would say, hey, you know, if there's someone you want to give a hug to, you need to ask them to give a hug, you know, and once they got a little older, if you're going to hold hands, ask for consent, if you're going to kiss someone, ask for consent. So I drill that into their heads. And um, this weekend, so first my older, my youngest son, the 17 year old went to junior prom, and he wanted to spend the night at a friend's house. And um, where it was boys and girls both spending the night and the parents said, you know, no, there won't be any drinking, there won't be any drugs, the kids are welcome to stay over. So we had a serious conversation at the dinner table with him about, again, you know, no alcohol, no drugs, no sex. And, and his response was like, wow, he's like, first, I'm scared of drugs and I'm not going to have sex. I mean, he just like kind of, he, so he's like, you know, I know I'm hearing this. I'm like, well, we have to have these conversations. So that, that was his response to it was funny. But then his brother was also home this weekend from college and we had a conversation and he admitted to me for the first time, he's been dating um, the same girl, girlfriend for a little over a year, probably maybe going on a year and a half. And he said, mom, actually, I've never Never told you this, but the first time I went to kiss Callie, his girlfriend, um, I asked her if I could kiss her and she actually said no. Um, so for me, that was a huge mom win because I was like, well, something they're listening and hearing what I have to say. And, and, and then, then, then he was like, yeah, and you know, you've always said that. So, you know, I always, ask, you know, so I, for me, that was huge to know that, you know, that ongoing conversations about things like this, like consent that are really important is something that is sinking in to their um, young male adult brains. So, I love it. That's a huge I love well, I just like to say thank you for sharing that, Kathy, because um, my 17 year old is going to prom on Saturday <laughs> <laughs> with a date. <laughs> so we've been having that conversation yeah. too. So I hope it's sinking in. Yes. I love it. Oh, um, I might have got a while to go before I'm at that stage. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. This is why you all know I learned all these things from Kathy. I'm like, okay, <laughs> note to self, we're talking about consent. Um, I, we, we definitely uh, have that conversation a lot as well. Um, Kim, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you though about most challenging aspects of the past couple of years. Um, and also with respect to your job as a person who works directly with students who are moms and dads and um, parents in general, um, what are the challenges that you've noticed um, in that community as well as any unexpected or positive things that have arisen? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, early on um, when my office switched to um, virtual um, check-in and office hours, you know, one of the things that I was hearing a lot, um, particularly from moms, was the managing managing um, emotions or, and disappointment of their kids. Um, that was something that, uh, because as things, if you early on, when the kids went home from school, you know, things just kept continuing to be canceled. It was kind of one thing after another of sporting events, um, even spring break in the way, you know, trips that had been uh, scheduled, you know, opportunities, you know, particularly some of the international families that I work with um, were going to have an opportunity to do some traveling. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing other parts of Michigan, other parts of the country, even, and all of that was really canceled. So I. I would get check-ins from 
um, parents. And again, it was mostly moms who were kind of doing this management of these emotions around just how do you talk about disappointment when I also am feeling the same disappointment as they are? You know, it's terrible what's happening and we're grateful to be healthy, you know, and alive. So that balance of um, wanting to honor their kids, you know, feelings and emotions and that uh, disappointment was, you know, okay. And how they were feeling was perfectly um, fine, but also being mindful that, you know, things were happening, you know, that were out of the control. So that was something that was difficult for a lot of families. Um, in addition to trying to manage their own schoolwork, um, childcare continues to be a, a challenge, I, I think both for student families and uh, professional families at, at MSU, but also, you know, around the country. Uh, I'm the president of um, our affiliate um, child care center on campus um, of the board there, and it's incredibly short staffed, you know, hours have changed. So for students, just being able to navigate, you know, coursework as we returned back to uh, expectations around in-person classes and things. So everybody wasn't happy about the return to in-person classes because those virtual opportunities were really helpful for some um, parents around because of the childcare issue. Um, so, and I would definitely say there were some unexpected or unanticipated positive things that I heard a lot and also experienced. And a lot of that was uh, particularly around opportunities to spend time and have conversations with their uh -huh. kids. Normally in a pre-COVID world, one of the things that we used to hear a lot um, from our student parents is that they didn't have time for the extras, the fun stuff, the, um, you know, opportunities to just spend time reading with their kids or, you know, asking them different questions about life, about current events. And so this pandemic time slowed us down into the point where um, they could, and myself also think about, you know, what was really important, almost really get to know our kids. I got to know my then 15 year old um, a lot better um, than I think I would have had he had all of his normal outings because he's a social, very social being. So the fact that we had time to really, you know, just talk and, and dream and uh, be silly together, you know, aligned with the rest of the family was a really positive um, opportunity. And that was one of the things that we tried to do with our student families virtually um, in the time is create those um, moments and opportunities for them to do the same thing. So those were definitely positive, you know, really positive outcomes. And I guess the last thing that I would just say about that is the re reprioritizing no. I had a mom, a student mom say that to me. She said, you know what I learned? No is a complete sentence. And I thought, <laughs> I'm still, that's awesome. I'm stealing that. No absolutely is a complete sentence. And for her, um, she is the primary parent in a two, um, two parent household. And she is also the student. And she really has taken a lot of time to learn about saying no and, and understanding that no doesn't necessarily require a whole bunch of um, after explaining that no was no. And I thought that's going on our social media, that's going <laughs> all over. No is a complete sentence. So um, that was definitely a positive takeaway and learning opportunity for all of us. Any, any follow-ups or reactions from the other three of you? I think, you know, working from home has been such a, you know, it, it, like in between meetings, you can go get baby snuggles, you know, or like check in with, you know, we, we end up passing them back and forth a lot. You know, it's like, okay, your meeting is here and my meeting's at, at this time. And so, okay, great. We'll pass them off, you know. Um, and we have a little bit of help with her mom and um, one of her former students who's been babysitting for us, but we haven't had childcare. Uh, we were on a wait list. Um, and it, for that way, we, it's, we were just past the first trimester. So we're telling people that we're having a baby and everyone that we knew that worked in Michigan state was like, get on right now, wait lists <laughs> for childcare. You're probably already behind. <laughs> and we're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Also, congratulations, but, but, you know, like it was this urgency <laughs> to do it. And I see, I see why now, um, but, you know, we were able to, 
have this kind of patchwork quilt of support around us as and 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 juggle you know working some on the weekends working some in the evenings and thankfully both of our jobs are, are that kind of flexible um because i can't imagine how hard it would be to be completely gone at work from like in an office from like eight to five um every day and i, I just i can't imagine i i wouldn't want a job like that anyway um but um but yeah i think that the hidden um perks of that and i think even for ashley and i we got married and bought a house and had a baby during all during a pandemic and our the time that we've spent together quarantining and being in our little bunker uh you know it's also accelerated i think our relationship um and you know it feels like we've feels like we've been together a lot longer <laughs> than we have because it's been the two of us, you know, just uh, doing so much uh, together. And so that's that's been something that I wouldn't take back. Um, yeah. And I think um, as I, I listen to the story as a, a diversity person, I think of the advantages that all five of us have on this call. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of how much childcare cost and some of our, um, mm -hmm families and maybe our listeners are struggling mm -hmm. to pay for daycare. I think of how we have the autonomy um, possibly in our positions to, you know, up and leave, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we met, um, when we forget our child or they need to take off or we have to work for home. But as I think about um, the someone who's listening to this podcast and might not have the advantages that we have, um, as we discuss this, I think of um, allyship. I think mm -hmm. of uh, resources, how um, self-advocacy could be um, a possibility for people who might not have this um, ability to do a lot of things that we're discussing um, in regards to um, food. Uh, we, we like to feed our babies, right? Uh, my dog, the 17 year old eats a lot at, and we know that food prices and inflation and um, we have to put that in the conversation and we have to put um, just a, a mirror on mm -hmm. everyone who might not be able to um, have that. And what can we do in our positions? And what I do is um, when I'm in spaces, I make sure um, that I am bringing attention to that. Um, do we have food banks on campus? Do we have um, the ability to donate time to people if you have extra time um, or vacation time? Do you have the ability in your circle of influence to help a mom who might be an admin, who might not be at the top of the totem pole um, in regards to um, hierarchy? And so I just wanted to put that in space and leave room for, for people, um, moms, partners who just not be able to be at that point yet. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think that's a really important point to remember is that, you know, we're all, we're all employed, right. And have jobs and all of that. Um, and I think it's, it's really key. I think one of the other um, things I think a little bit about are the strategies that we use or adopted or started to figure out. Um, and so Alexandria, can I stay with you for a moment and talk a little bit about some of the things that you're continuing to do today that maybe even though we're back in some level of, I don't even know what we're in right now. We're not post pandemic. <laughs> we're like continuing, evolving, you know, People can wear masks when they want, I guess, is the new norm. But what are some strategies that um, you're kind of keeping and holding on to and carrying from this time? Oh, there's so many. I think the pandemic um, has taught me I am type A personality. I do <laughs> like to control things sometimes. Uh, the pandemic has thrown that away. Um, <laughs> Times when my daughter looks at me and she's like, who are you? You mean you're not mad? <laughs> no, <laughs> not mad. It's, uh, it's a pandemic. That's my, uh, that's my go-to. Um, and so giving myself grace as well as others, um, not controlling what I can control, and then um, letting everything really just go. I took a more nonchalant attitude about a lot of things. Um, I think um, empathet empathy is one thing that I, I thought I practiced pre-pandemic, um, but I am honing on in it. 
I am in the trenches in ways that I can improve and just making sure that people around me and communities and um, conversations that I'm having that uh, I'm practicing empathy. And in, as I do the diversity work and I have difficult conversations with people with you know, not popular views, um, empathy is something that um, I am um, keeping and always being aware of at this time. And mental and physical health. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a cancer scare. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that just adds to my non bad attitude too. Like, this is all, <laughs> this is all temporary, right? Um, when you have a cancer scare, you're like, hey, that's really not a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. and mental and physical health are just those two and being empathetic. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And I'm glad to hear you're okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it is, it is amazing how sometimes you get those moments of like all of these things I was worried about before I no longer need to worry about. And I, I think I'm a worrier. Um, and so in some ways it's like, well, this is just what we're doing now. So um, can't let it go. Right. Um, I also want to say too, I think the work that you're doing, Alexandria, at the, at the institutional structural level is really key. So as we're talking about kind of our own lived experiences, I think one of the kind of key pieces that we can hopefully also consider is how can we advocate for change within our organizations or within the larger profession? Um, and I know there's certainly been kind of a movement towards work-life balance or work-life integration, this kind of concept of self-care, community care. Um, and Meg actually came and guest lectured in my class that I <laughs> teach about this particular topic. So, um, and as a new mom, I can imagine there's a, a layer of this that is um, maybe more present in terms of sleep or, or also the physical health piece. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you're doing to kind of consider self-care? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. And if I put into practice consistently all the things that I share in my guest lectures, I'd be <laughs> a happier, healthier person. Um, but because um, it's hard, it's just really hard. Um, but I, I think um, the, the first thing that when I think about self care is like I have to be in tune with myself. Like I have to be leave enough room for me to notice how I'm actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know at this age, like what my tells are, you know, a certain kind of sharpness that comes out in my tone or just a lack of my threshold for frustration becomes very small. Um, my wife often catches before I do that I'm stressed out uh, because of those things. Cause she's so finely tuned to like, she's like, I think maybe you need some alone time tonight. And I'll think, I'll be like, no, I think I'm fine. She's like, I think you need some alone time tonight. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's wonderful to have, but then to, to that point too, self-care also really re is, it's a misnomer because it's a community care. It's a, it's being around people who, um, who notice and help you notice what you might need to be your best self, to be, you know, to, to, to have that person show up. Um, and then, and then responding. And, but what's been so hard about the pandemic is that so many of my self-care strategies have been stripped from me. Um, the pandemic has created distance, distance between me and people that I love, me and things that I love, um, and, mm. and the strategies that I have come to finally, I finally tuned <laughs> through years of my own therapy, the things that I do to take care of myself. And, I, and so many of them have been um, taken away. Uh, I've had to dig really deep um, and, and look for new ways to center myself, to ground myself. I've had to work really hard to do that. Um, but I think, so it's, it's just doubling down on the things that we know work, even if they're simple. Um, it's been humbling too. I, I've found that a lot of the, the breathing exercises and um, like I did a three minute body scan uh, meditation uh, this morning and it was just, just, it, you know, I, it's the kind of thing where I think, is that really going to help with three minutes? Like, I, I'm just going to go on with my day, but it's, it's taking it seriously. And it's making, again, just a little bit of time. I don't have time or the attention span for a 15 minute meditation. I cannot do it. I've tried three minutes I can do. <laughs> so it's also finding what works for you and not like guilt tripping yourself. Into something. Yeah. You know, like I didn't have time for like, a full on workout, but you know what? I walked up and down the stairs a couple of times. So I think that has been one of my mantras 
is, is that something is always better than nothing. And if I don't have time to do a full workout, I don't have time to journal and really connect with myself, what is something that I can do in the time that I have? Um, and, and that's been really helpful. Um, and then the last thing I have been thinking about a lot lately has been slowing down and asking myself like gently, hey, what do you wanna do right now? You've got this like open block of time. What do you want to do? Instead of filling it with my to-do list or the things I should do, it's just slowing that down because especially as a new mom, like what I want to do, cause sometimes so far away, <laughs> I wanna sleep through the night. That could be years. Like, <laughs> like so I, you know, I've got to, but so there's a lot of things that I want to do that I can't do, but but st- keeping in touch with myself and saying, but what, I'm still a full person, you know? And, and yeah, a lot of my, Karen gets to be, he's the, he's the, you know, where most of my energy and free time goes. And then Ashley gets the rest of, the, of whatever I have, but, but I still have to have stuff for myself to have something to give. And so it's just, what is it that I want right now? How do I want to spend this little bit of time that I have and like tuning into that and honoring that. Um, and so again, it can be a five minute thing but it's living with the intention to care for myself and to recognize myself as like worthy of, of that time. A lot less discretionary time these days, but it's not about the quantity, it's about the intention. Um, and, and that's what I've really been trying to focus on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're already at the end of our time. Um, and I know, Alexandria, you have something else you're gonna go to. So I'm gonna start with you. And then if you need to dip out, you absolutely can. Um, so our podcast is called Student Affairs Now. We always kind of end with the question, if you could take a moment to summarize what you're thinking, pondering, questioning, excited about, or something that came up during this episode that you wanna like continue thinking on, um, that would be great. So I'll start with you, Alexandria. I think I'm excited about the possibility of so many opportunities for our our nation, our community um, to be better. There is a lot of things that are coming up. There's um, the ending of the academic year and what that looks like for college campuses. I think of um, Asian American Pacific Islander Month is coming up. And I'm, I'm thinking of my um, AAPI brothers and sisters and Sam's and, and everything. And then the two year anniversary of George Floyd, so many things that are going on. And what's that going to show up um, for, for our world? I um, have picked a word that I'm continuously gonna be using um, and that is grace. Mm-hmm. And I think as moms, we need to give each other grace sometimes we can be kind of mean to other moms and we need to give ourselves grace as doing the best that we can I can I love what um, Meg said about just do something right Uh, you don't have to be the the whole yoga for an hour meditation for an hour if you can just get five minutes in so give yourself grace and in closing thank you Heather for having this um this platform, this um, information highway um, for student affairs and in, in our pro- uh, profession, but grace and the possibility of doing better and being better than we were tomorrow, yesterday, and the year before. So grace is my word. Well, thank you again so much for your work in establishing SAMS as a space and for joining us today, Alexandra. I really appreciate it. Meg, what's your kind of closing closing thought about um, what's happening now? Well, um, this podcast, like even pre- preparing for it and thinking, you know, like what you know what I was going to say or things I would discuss, um, and uh, you know, I think uh, for a lot of folks that um, becoming a mom has a lot of other layers to it. Um, for myself, my relationship with my own mom was something that was. Um, you know, it was, it was a challenging relationship. Um, and, and so, um, and still is sometimes. Um, and uh, so bec- entering into, um, into motherhood had like a weight to it because of that. Um, and, and, and I also think of the non-traditional path that I've taken to motherhood where, you know, my wife carried our son um, using a donor. And so like, you know, like, what does that mean? Am I, how am I a mom? And how is that journey different than, than other moms. And sometimes I feel myself wanting to explain that when someone's like, oh my gosh, you're a mom. I was at the chiropractor and someone was talking about, 
their wrist, both of our wrists hurt from carrying our growing babies. And she's like, oh my gosh. And she was bonding with me. I almost wanted to say, well, but my wife had the baby, you know, like this like disclaimer that I'm not quite, you know, do I get to sign up for the moms groups? Because I mean, I'm a mom, right? So I, I think there are a lot of people mm. out there too that have had a non-traditional path to motherhood um, or not what they expect. And I just think that like, what, like how do we own our place in the constellation of motherhood um, mm. and, and feel confident and not feel secure in that? Because, you know, we talk about an imposter syndrome and all the different ways that that comes up in higher education spaces. But I think this is one of those two is, is that it feels like um, there's an asterisk by my name when I say, like, I'm a mom. Here's the story of how I mean, why I mean that, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's been part of part of my my journey, too, is, is resting um, in that uh, that moms look different. <laughs> the journey mm -hmm. and experience of motherhood looks different. And to be, um, yeah, to, to be confident and proud of the space that I take up in that way. Oh, thank you so much for naming that. I want to give you air hugs. <laughs> um, you are such a mom. You are such a mom. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate that, Meg. Um, Kathy, what are your takeaways? Um, what are you thinking about now? Um, so I am thinking about, I'm um, a little bit back to one of the earlier questions about what are we taking, like lessons learned or things we think about that we gained for COVID. And part of it is um, remembering the flexibility that we had to have. And I think that it continues to be a really great tool, um, the, the flexibility to move on. I also think um, all of Alexandria's comments about grace is so important because I think we learned that that was really important during COVID. And that's not something I want us to forget yeah. um, as we're moving forward. So not only grace with other moms, but I think grace with our coworkers and colleagues and partners um, and grace with our children because sometimes they know how to push your buttons and you just have to like take a deep breath or walk in another room for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, because they also are, you know, growing and learning little humans. So, so I think that's important. So I think those things I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking about then how do we look at this, the summer in particular for staff and the people that we work with, like we really need some renewal time and we need some kind of that hopefully an ability to take a step back, take a big breath, have some time off and, and vacation time and being able to kind of then refocus and remember why we're in this field and, and why we, you know, a lot of us have chosen this, this career and that we love it and hopefully reconnecting with the why of why you love what you're doing and that helps energize you moving into the fall. Cause I don't, I think things are probably still going to be difficult as we move in and out of how do we navigate just the pandemic that probably is never really going to truly end and we keep having issues around it. So, so I think looking at that and having that refresh and renewal time the summer and hopefully that also helps us with you know people are thinking about leaving the the field actually maybe having a break and and then deciding you know is it do i want to continue here or do i want to look at other options um, as part of that but i think everyone's ready for that kind of ability to take a breath and have a break yes oh my gosh yes a hundred percent kim what are your uh, takeaways or reactions yeah i mean honestly mine you know was grace to give more grace and to also receive it mm. you know a lot of times I think moms in particular are we're very hard on ourselves and even sometimes are the ones placing the un you know the unrealistic expectation or the expectation period to do certain things so just this conversation today just really reinforced for me um, about sharing that reminder to uh, with our families you know that I work with but then you know also for me is that give grace, but to receive it as well. Um. Yes, 100%. And I, I just want to um, echo my gratitude and gratefulness for all of you and for Alexander who had to duck out um, for joining today. And uh, for those who are concerned that we are having a mom's episode, but not a dad's episode, there will be a dad's episode being hosted by Glenn de Guzman. Apparently there's a Facebook group called Student Affairs Dads Don't Call Us Sad. Um, which makes me laugh every time I think of it. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining and for sharing your contributions today um, on this conversation. And also just to send a heartfelt appreciation to our dedicated behind the scenes work of Nat Ambrosi, our production assistant. Thanks so much, Nat. 
If you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, check out our growing archives. Thank you to, so much to our sponsors of today's episode. Simplicity is the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including but not limited to career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Our second sponsor today is Vector Solutions or EverFi. How will your institution rise to reach today's socially conscious generation? These students report commitments to safety, well being, and inclusion as important as academic rigor when selecting a college. It's time to reimagine the work of student affairs as an investment, not an expense. For over 20 years, Vector Solutions, which now includes the Campus Prevention Network, formerly EverFi, has been the partner of choice for 2,000 plus colleges and universities and national organizations. With nine efficacy studies behind our courses, you can trust and have full confidence that you will be using the standard of care for student safety, well-being, and inclusion. Transform the future of your institution and the community you serve. Learn more at vectorsolutions.com slash studentaffairsnow. Please take a moment to visit our website and click on the sponsors link to learn more about each of our partners. Again, I'm Heather Shea. Thanks to everyone who is listening and to everyone who is watching. We wish everyone a happy Mother's Day and we look forward to making it a great week.